Tonight, Dr. Schmid will introduce the history, themes, and evolution of the exhibition, The Orleans Collection, that for the first time in over 200 years reunites works from the celebrated collection of French Regent Philippe II, Duke of Orleans. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vanessa Schmid. Uh, I'm just so delighted uh, to talk to you about the process, about the show. I've, uh, I've prepared actually something uh, rather informal. I think we should um, look together, talk about the themes and uh, specific works of art in the show. And I'm also trying to map out for you uh, the ideas and thoughts behind the different sections of the exhibition and how conceptually the different exhibition sections are organized. Our namesake, Philippe II, Duke of Orléans, was uh, was the, served as the regent of France and was one of European art's greatest art collectors. Moving back to show you the, the resplendent uh, bust uh, that is on the title wall, it uh, has come from Versailles and likely has, uh, hasn't, hasn't left Versailles in over, over a century, if not even earlier. It uh, was commissioned in 1715 at the inauguration of the Regency by Philippe II. Philippe II, uh, we are named after him because, as I mentioned, he served as Regent of France. This was between the years of 1713 and 1723. He, um, he was, and of course, this is our, our portrait of our Duke looking very, very stately uh, in ceremonial armor. In the latter years of Louis XIV's reign, Louis, uh, that is the Sun King, if you'll excuse me, it's important to review a little history. Uh, the two, uh, two heirs to the throne die in 1711 and 1712. There is a great-grandson that was born in 1710, and this was to be Louis XV. The portrait we have in the show here is uh, an extraordinary portrait uh, from the studio of Hyacinthe Rigaud, uh, court portraitist, uh, also uh, to, uh, to Louis XIV, and this was commissioned by the Duke at the inauguration of the Regency in order to celebrate uh, the continuity of the, re of the reign and of the, of the line because this is in fact a direct uh, quotation of an earlier portrait by Louis XIV. Uh, what's so wonderful about it when you go see it in the exhibition is uh, how he is really a boy king. He's a five-year-old boy, almost petulantly pursing his lips and directing uh, the realm. He holds the rule of law with the fleur de lis, the bourbon uh, device. He wears all of his accoutrements of power and legitimacy. This is his order and these gorgeous, gorgeous robes. This ermine uh, fur robe is, uh, is uh, just this, this, this cascade of, of glorious fur, and he extends his leg. On here is actually a garter, which is another marker of his, of his lineage, and his elegant uh, leg sitting on the pillow. It's a resplendent portrait, really quite large, and um, we're delighted to have it. And so, uh, serving as regent, uh, which the Duke's, uh, his, um, his role as regent was to enforce stability and uh, to oversee the education of Louis XV. His job was in fact very difficult. Louis XIV, as you know, built the vast complexes at Versailles, and he also waged many, many wars uh, in, the la in the latter uh, years, in the latter decades of the 17th century. Uh, thus, what Philippe II inherited was a near bankrupt throne that he had to cope with, uh, on top of the fact that there was great political uh, instability, because the regencies are, in, are times of instability as a general matter. Uh, what Philippe was able to de deliver, in fact, in his short eight years at uh, what he was able to deliver at, upon his death was, in fact, a much more stable realm. And one of the essays in the catalog uh, does an excellent job of reviewing this and how, uh, and is an important reassessment uh, written by a French scholar and how he was able to devise a range of economic policies of which the Louisiana, po the Louisiana col colony was one of them. But what is Philippe II most known for today? And in his day, in fact, he was also known as a great, great patron of the arts. 
Here he is represented in the year of our founding, 1718, when the first paintings you, ex you encounter in the exhibition. He is shown in this gorgeous medallion uh, portrait, and you'll note these different shades of brown and gray. The painting was actually made as a design for an engraving. It was, it's called a grisaille, meaning in shades of gray. And this was to serve as the frontispiece of a book that was to commemorate and uh, glorify the Regency. He's presented in a medallion portrait. Over here, you can see the crowning of fame, fame trumpeting, blowing, uh, uh, proclaiming his glory. And then here is Minerva. Minerva identified always by her wonderful hat. She is uh, the goddess of war, but also the patroness of the arts. Who is below? We have Law. This is, again, the scepter we just saw in the portrait with the, 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 the fleur de lys. And, this, and law is, of course, setting her foot on law books. So he is the rightful ruler. Again, this emphasis on, on legitimacy in a, in, a, in, in a time of transition. And what do we see here with her back to us? This is the arts. You'll notice a palette, a paint palette, a bust. You can even see in the painting itself some drawing books and uh, books for study. So therefore, what is he presenting himself first and foremost, ruler of the realm, legitimate ruler and patron of the arts? Hence is our subject. And then, of course, what is uh, below is uh, the realm he, um, he rules and uh, also the maritime empire, which he helped to expand. And uh, particularly with the founding of New Orleans in 1718. Over here, rushing in with his caduceus and this winged hat, this is Mercury. Mercury is not only the messenger god, but he is also uh, the god of commerce and, uh, and, uh, and a healthy economy, so to speak. So here he is congratulating and presiding over. And here, over here, is uh, prudence and or navigation. I, I think one can argue for either lighting the way of good judgment. So it was so wonderful to, to be able to use this uh, portrait and bring it here as the, as the masthead of our very subject. Pardon, little slide. So what do we know about Philippe's collection? Upon his death in 1723, the inventory of his death lists 537 paintings that were all on view in actually a relatively grand but relatively confined spaces of his palace in Paris. Of those 575, we have traced only 183 today. The pictures that he collected, he collected in only probably a little over two decades. This is an, an astounding, astounding uh, mat collection. In addition to that was the incredible quality of the collection. As we will review, some of the, his favorite masterpieces are now uh, founding and important pictures in uh, many of the great, uh, great public institutions in Europe and America. He collected in an incredible range of ways. He collected, he purchased with dealers. He purchased en bloc, meaning he purchases large groups of pictures. He sourced pictures around the capital and bought at estate sales. There is no question he was a voracious collector. We know from an early source of uh, what he's writing in about 1718 that in his youth at Versailles, because that's where he was, um, that's where uh, he was educated, he would get retire at night to paint. We know that he actually tried to learn how to paint, and he worked with who would later become his court painter, Antoine Coipel, to learn painting, to read theories of painting, and also to work in etching and drawing. So there's no question that there was a deep interest here, and the subject of our show is to try and plumb how we can get at those, the, 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 the depth of the, that interest. Already in his lifetime, the collection was very well known. There's no question it was part of his public's persona, a part of a self-conscious projected image, not only of power and cultivation, but uh, which was, was typical of, of, of princely 
uh, princes of this period, but certainly was uh, was uh, I think a defining part of his of his uh, of his persona of his of his public image. What I'm showing you here is a publication of 1727, which is the first uh, description, uh, a sort of catalog of the of the of the collection. So already in 1727, there's a publication about it. By mid-century in 18th century Paris, the collection, which is now, which is then with his heirs, is viewed, uh, is started to visit, visited by visitors of the public, and uh, was really uh, an attraction in Paris. You could knock on the door, you, they had certain assigned hours. We're not quite sure at what point this was initiated, but somewhere around mid-century. So the collection continues to have uh, a life well beyond the Duke's lifetime, and also as, uh, as a, the collection itself also grows and shifts with his heirs, though largely stayed the same. But this public nature of the collection is what shifts over time. And ultimately, unfortunately, the incredible fame of this collection, pardon me, was its undoing. The great-grandson of our Duke, Louis-Philippe-Joseph d'Orléans, quite a name. Uh, his moniker was Philippe Égalité, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. He, living in the 1680s, decided to sell the collection. The great-grandson, Louis-Philippe Égalité, this was, of course, on the eve of the, on the, eve of the French Revolution, and uh, Philippe Égalité was not only from an early phase uh, quite profligate and a big spender, simply couldn't live within his means, he also spearheaded a huge campaign to completely redecorate the palace. Uh, he's borrowing money left and right. And uh, what does he see as an asset he can use? Tragically, he decides to sell the collection. And this is an important part of our story. The dispersal of this collection and the impact of that on the art world and the early founding museums is also a part of our story, which I'll get to later. What I'm showing you here are, I, I'm a big fan of documents, but don't worry, we're looking at paintings more. I know I just showed you two book covers, right? But, um, but bear with me. So here is uh, gorgeous Louis-Philippe uh, Igueté. And this is the catalog of the painting sales at the Lyceum Theatre in London. And these, uh, this particular sale was in uh, 1798. Here is a wonderful artist drawing that we'll look at again, uh, which shows the, the hanging of the different pictures. You can already see the volume. You've got to just, just, they're what, they're four high, five high, four high. And, uh, and there's a key. This is a wonderful, wonderful record. And so these sales that took place in London in the 1790s are in fact the last time our pictures were together. And so that marks uh, 227 years since the pictures were all together and um, until this day. And here they are, right in New Orleans. So, the task at hand. And I hope you don't mind I indulge. Here I am. <laughs> there I am. So, this is the Palais Royal. The Palais Royal, you may know, is one of Paris's lovely, lovely public spaces today. And this was the Duke's palace. Here I am visiting it uh, in my first trip to Paris. And as I've said in other lectures, good God, I look 10 years younger. I had no idea what was on the horizon with meetings and the ups and downs of securing loans and and research, and, and you'll see actually what's uh, kind of interesting, this is the forecourt, uh, this is where you go in, this is the Rue Saint-Honoré on the right back of Bank of Paris, and this is the forecourt where you have actually one of the first uh, installations um, in, uh, of contemporary art in a historical building. This is, these are, um, this is a work by Daniel Buren, a French artist, uh, installed in the late 80s and actually uh, sparked a very important, important and early debate about the role of site-specific art and the interventions of contemporary art in historic buildings. But anyway, pardon, that is a side note. So the task at hand. So we en embarked to say, of course, this is, the, this is our glorious uh, namesake and this is how we can celebrate the New Orleans tricentennial. Well, how do you conceive an exhibition on a history of collecting topic? How do you conceive an exhibition uh, about a man, but also a collection that has a longer life, as I've said, a collection that gets dispersed? How do you bring to life things that aren't there, which we'll also talk about? And what is the difference between, of course, an exhibition and a catalog? One of the things that uh, I think is so evocative about this show is how we're reuniting objects. We're physically bringing them back 
together. And of course, what any installation does and what any uh, the exhibition does is is cre create juxtapositions and to foster new ideas and, and, and connections and things something that can only be experiential and so there's a way and there are various ways I will review how the experience of this um, collection and the spaces of the exhibition have been designed to evoke and make you also think about the original setting of these paintings well not the original setting they're setting at the Palais Royal and so much research and much uh, sleuthing, looking at that first early collection books from 1727, trying to uh, find and go through ranges of materials, speak with colleagues who have worked on the subject, so on and so forth. Uh, several years later, here we are, and what we were able to do is to bring together 38 objects to tell the story of this uh, collection, the life of the collection and its legacy. And we have brought to you uh, objects from 25 uh, institutions. The exhibition is organized in, in eight loose sections, and I'm not going to take you through every one, but I think uh, I'd, I'd like to kind of map it out a little bit for you, and then you can come back and, and go to the galleries, uh, perhaps with, with uh, new or more informed eyes and other ideas. So our first section, which I'll review in a moment, is the Palais Royal. I already mentioned his, his glorious uh, palace in, uh, in the center of the right bank of Paris. Uh, then we go through our portraits, which I've already reviewed, what I call the cast of characters, the, what was the Regency, Louis XIV, Louis XV, and our Duke. From there, we start a main section, which uh, I have called the Duke as Collector, uh, which, uh, which views, uh, tries to, with each object, position each object as a way of talking about the range of trends and interests that he, uh, that he had, the types of art he was particularly interested, and their display, and also how he acquired them. Then we have the mini sections. This is about a large purchase of painting, we'll review in a minute. This is a cabinet of uh, dedicated to a particular artist. And then we go further into smaller uh, sections. Here we have a Dutch and Flemish cabinet, of which I'll show you a wonderful picture. And then the last two sections uh, we'll review um, together until we finish with the legacy. The Palais Royal, as I already mentioned, is in the center of the right bank of Paris. This is uh, a map from about the 1730s. Um, maybe I should have chosen a different view, but the River Seine is over here, if you know Paris. The Louvre is right here. It's right across the way. And this is the Palais Royal. You'll notice it's in the middle of a very developed neighborhood. This is a neighborhood that uh, was actually a rather new neighborhood, had been developed uh, in the 30 to 50 years prior, and was really now just a burgeoning neighborhood full of uh, connoisseurs, uh, wealthy financiers, and uh, we have a wonderful map in, the, in, the, in the, the exhibition catalog that shows you uh, his network and circle and who lived where and also some of the artist studios. So, uh, so this is an exciting moment in, in Paris, but also what is happening during the Regency is that court is coming back to Paris. We talked about Versailles, Louis XIV's Versailles. Uh, so this, uh, this is also, I think, a wonderful um, part of our story where, as part of the urban fabric, the Palais Royal and its collection, the Duke as he receives guests, the display of his collection, has a somewhat different um, weight or sense that it is in, this, in the middle of this urban fabric. It, it, um, you imagine it had a lot of exposure, and I, it, it certainly would have, whereas Versailles, I mean, both places are, have a somewhat, uh, certainly are limited to court visitors, but that it's in the center of the city is, is, um, is really evocative and part of our story. I should say uh, one of the, um, the main paintings galleries were along here, that actually the public spaces um, the, where the paintings were, sorry, the spaces where the paintings were on view uh, were actually um, not the entire complex of the, of, the, of the palace, and we'll review that later. So here's just a beautiful view of the front courtyard as it is today. And here's our um, first section um, of the exhibition, reviewing already what I've just uh, mentioned. This is, again, another view that I just wanted to throw in some some beautiful views. And these are the gardens as they are now. 
Uh, they are um, lovely spaces and uh, lined with uh, ground floor uh, shops and, and restaurants and so on. What we include in this first section of the exhibition devoted to the Palais Royal is a plan that we, uh, we've conceived in conjunction with our architectural historian uh, on the project. And what this plan is, this shows the ceremonial and public spaces of the Palais Royal. This is in effect, as I mentioned, it goes from here to here. This is exactly what you're looking at. I know, I'm a, I hope that's not too confusing but you'll have to trust me. So over here, this is, this is the main courtyard, and then over here are all uh, private apartments uh, for the family, everybody, the, 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 the household. And so what we've done is not only schematize a plan and give it and uh, go through and review the different spaces, but we've also shown you and tried to consider how the visitor went through the palace. It was absolutely a guided and directed visit, and there is a, an important way to think about the sequence of paintings and how one experienced the work of art as you went through the space, which was absolutely designed in every way to impress the visitor as much as possible. You first started in the chambre à coucher, which uh, in the French tradition, uh, this was the king's bedroom. Uh, where one would wake, and so while he was not king, there was a bedroom modeled on Versailles. Again, this extreme importance in the residency, in the uh, in the Regency, to uh, to uh, project an image of, of continuity and stability. And I am reviewing these because I think it's important. Uh, it will it, it comes out throughout the exhibition, and I should say that uh, the 1724 inventory I mentioned itemizes all the paintings by room. Uh, if you have, uh, in working with inventories is, is fascinating and you often uh, know how they're going from a room working from left uh, to right, hand handwritten. And so what we've done throughout the exhibition is some of the paintings in the show, we show you where they were in the palace by, by locating you uh, with a map. But let me go back through as our, our journey through the palace. So you start with the royal bedroom, then you proceed at number two with something called the Poussin Cattle cabinet. You may or not, may not know the name Poussin. This is the artist, Nicolas Poussin, considered the founder of French painting. And so what is he doing at the crossroads of the palace? The first place you get is a monument, as a room dedicated to French art. That's quite a political statement. He also uh, amassed a very important collection uh, of, of Poussins that was, uh, and they were rare uh, paintings to, to acquire. After that, you proceeded through the Hall of Illustrious Men. You might go on to have a, have a meeting with him. That, that's where his, his uh, Camille de Conseil, or his office was. And this Hall of Illustrious Men was, of course, dedicated to, to, to French uh, illustrious men. So again, this double hitter of, uh, of the strength of the French. You either went through here, where the paintings were smaller paintings cabinets, or then you proceeded through the four rooms of extremely grand galleries. These overlooked the gardens, huge windows, and uh, by all accounts of visitors, the paintings just, they were th often stacked kind of three high, and they just completely uh, overwhelmed you. And he really put everything, uh, his biggest pictures, his most magnificent pictures, in this, uh, this, this, this suite of rooms. And so just imagine one, two, three, four, you're really kind of overwhelmed and, and looking at, at great masterpieces. You then come to the culmination of this beautiful domed room, we'll review in a minute, and where you end is this grand hall way here. This is called the Gallery of Aeneas, of which we have a wonderful reconstruction uh, in the catalog. And what this did was actually, this was uh, designed to reference the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. So again, these wonderful references and interconnections with, um, with, with rulership. And uh, the bust of little Louis XV was at the end, uh, celebrating the who would be future king. And what, did he, what he commissioned for this gallery of Aeneas, the whole gallery, was dedicated to, uh, the to Aeneas, of course, the main figure of Virgil's Aeneid, so uh, the mythical ancestor of ancient Rome. And the walls were lined with paintings dedicated to Aeneas, and then the ceiling was a, a, a resplendent 
um, a magnificent ceiling. And uh, the ceiling, the sketch for the ceiling, is, dominates our first exhibition gallery. The cl complex was destroyed by his great-grandson, the one we all now dislike for having dispersed the whole collection. Um, and this uh, version that has come is the most important record of the ceiling. It was the version that was kept uh, by the artist, uh, the artist Antoine Coipel, and uh, by his descendants, uh, and from there given to the musée in Angers. It has never left France and only traveled from its museum once. It is a great privilege uh, to have this here. What we're looking at, of course, is the ceiling design. You have the fictive architecture here, all painted, and as it would have been painted, and then uh, executed in fresco on the barrel vault. And then you have an opening uh, to the sky. This uh, conceit of the, the glorious uh, opening to the sky, this kind of exploding clouds and light and movement uh, imitates and looks to the great Baroque ceiling paintings of Rome and, the, and Antoine Coipel would have uh, wor tra worked in Rome uh, in the, the later 1670s and 80s. And uh, so these references uh, were implicit. What we are looking at is Zeus, king of the gods, in a grand halo of light. Here is Venus. Venus is the mother of Aeneas. And so what she is doing is she is pleading with Zeus uh, for the safe return of her son on his travels and his trials and tribulations. Uh, all around are different gods gathered, hence called the assembly of the gods. Here's the gorgeous Hercules, look at him with his big club and uh, swirling uh, different figures and so on and so forth. It's, it's a delight to, uh, to look at the details and, uh, and consider it in, um, in the galleries. After the Palais Royal and setting the scene, we go to the Duke as collector, and that's where uh, the heart of the matter begins for the exhibition. You'll see me looking on head, air, head on here at a painting by Guido Rainey. This painting is here from Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, represents, uh, actually by its location, another fascinating feature of our exhibition is that because of the dispersal of these paintings, all your pictures are uh, far and wide in many different collections. So we haven't brought things just, to get just from uh, the great collections in London and Paris, but from Norfolk, Virginia, and El Paso, Texas. So uh, the far reach of, of these pictures is, um, is, such a, is such a part of the pleasure. And so through this uh, first exhibition uh, section, we think about the different um, aspects of his collecting different trends. Uh, for example, this uh, fabulous uh, Venus and Amor by Alessandro Allori, an artist working in Florence in the 1570s, is uh, a stunning over life size nude. Um, I hope most of you have already been in the galleries, but if you haven't, she's uh, just uh, gorgeous in her incredible uh, presence, her muscular presence, the uh, fine definition of, uh, of, her, of her torso, of her gestures of her muscles, and uh, there's a reason she's on the front of the building. She is our strong Venus, and in fact, uh, she is and was understood by, by this articulation uh, as a strong Venus in the time in terms of representing uh, the importance and morality of love, because Venus is the goddess of love. And what is going on here, we have, uh, she has is holding the bow and arrow, and this is Cupid, recognized by um, by, by his wings, of course, and this would have been for his bow and arrow, right, on the back. And there's a kind of playful, slightly erotic exchange, this gorgeous uh, gesture of these serpentine uh, lines, which are absolutely um, of their time, of what is called the, the maniera or the manners and manners period of, uh, of Florence. And so she's taking away his, or, or uh, threatening to take away his bow and arrow, because who is Cupid? He is the one who wreaks havoc on all of us humans. He strikes us with his arrow, and he makes us fall madly in love. Meanwhile, of course, if this young boy does not understand the, uh, the importance and the gravity of his job, he wreaks havoc on all of us. And when, what happens when he wreaks havoc, you see over here, if you can see these figures screaming and running away, that's envy and unrequited love. 
The other symbols of love are here, of course, the lovebirds, the doves, carnations uh, make reference to betrothal. And this golden sphere is a, is a, a reference to the golden apple, because Venus in an ancient uh, was, was named by the god Paris in the judgment of Paris in antiquity as the, uh, the most beautiful woman of antiquity. Hence, she is the god, goddess of love. And so this represents for our Duke and our show the, uh, the love of Florentine art, the hierarchy of Italian Renaissance art uh, for the Duke and his circle. Italian Renaissance art sat at the pinnacle. After that was the Venetian Renaissance, we'll review in a moment. And then uh, we'll go to the, his other penchants and interests, of course, with that, uh, the emphasis on French art as well. So the love of Italian art. Uh, and this, um, this is an interesting story of how it got to the Duke. It actually was, uh, the first uh, owner who commissioned it in Florence uh, brought it to Paris. He worked at the court of uh, Henry IV. And then this, in the 1600s, was, one, is, was in the collections of the, the princes of, of Condé, uh, the some of the greatest collectors in Paris in the 17th century, 1600s. And then uh, the Duke purchase it, purchases it at that estate sale. And so it gives you a bit of an example of how uh, he's consolidating what's already in Paris when he's collecting. Oh, here she is in the gallery. Pardon me. How could I forget that I put that slide in? But I also think the scale kind of reads there. She's just so uh, glorious. And I should say also that it was known in the period that this design reworks uh, a very, very famous uh, design that was later colored and painted um, by another artist, but the design was by Michelangelo. And so the ways in which uh, also, in our exhibition, we've tried to emphasize uh, not just their place in the collection, uh, the Duke's interests, but also where these, uh, uh, that this is a show about art. So the labels try and uh, explore uh, these um, ranges as well. And in fact, w in this installation where this painting is, the two other paintings in the room uh, are all actually part of a con conversation of Renaissance art. Another way in which he, he scoured the, the city of Paris for masterpieces uh, is an example in this work by Peter Paul Rubens. This is an oil sketch. And this was purchased um, by the descendants uh, of, of, of the people who commissioned it. So this is an oil sketch. We see the, Constant, the Emperor Constantine. This is young Constantine, of course, Constantine, Emperor of Rome. And this is the celebration of a figure, an allegorical figure of Rome, who, of course, at her feet are the wonderful babies, Romulus and Remus, with, with the she-wolf. This is a, an oil sketch. Rubens was well known. Uh, he actually, uh, did he invent somewhat? Yes, he did. He, uh, he worked in oil sketches as a way to make presentation pieces for his patrons. And uh, Rubens, of course, was, he was working in the 17th century. He uh, was one of the greatest international court artists of the 17th century. He worked in, in Antwerp, so he was a, a Netherlandish artist who worked at all the great courts of Europe, uh, England, uh, Madrid, and also Paris, and made these designs on his visit to Paris. He was really a celebrated artist uh, across Europe as a great court artist, uh, and in Paris, on a, an well through uh, the Duke's reign, was, uh, was a highly, highly valued artist. The Duke had 20 works by Rubens. And so these oil sketches that were made as presentation pieces for patrons um, are really wonderful in their, in their lack of finish. You'll see there's not much preparation for the panel. This is a panel painting. And very specific areas are worked up to communicate the composition, the story, uh, gesture, and so on. And please look at this and go into the gallery and enjoy the swift gestural brushwork, the light touches uh, that highlight and empathize and punctuate uh, gesture, emotion, and, uh, and light. It's really uh, a, a, a deft, uh, masterful uh, use of paint. And again, this, uh, the kind of different areas of finish are part of what make it so, make his oil sketches so evocative and so also um, intimate. You feel like you're really working at a part of a working process. And so um, these were made, uh, they, this was one of 12 panels that were uh, designs for tapestry series, large tapestries. 
that were woven in Paris. And what did the Duke do? He um, bought the whole series from the tapestry firm. So here's an example where he's really, he loves Rubens, he wants to acquire uh, a, great, a great work by him and, and, and finds them where he can. He's working with, with, with agents. And so all 12 of these diminutive oil sketches, it's strange to look at it so large on the screen, it's about this large. And so all 12 of those were shown as a group uh, in his grand gallery. And um, of course, there's no mistaking the fact that they are glorifying uh, an emperor of ancient Rome and this affiliation with uh, uh, the, the, the power and the, um, and the glory of the past is, 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 is built into um, its reflection on the current owner. Another way in which the Duke acquired works of art was through gifts. I think it's quite clear and we can see that because he was so uh, that he loved art and had that reputation to want more and more paintings, uh, there are a range of traced gifts. This was uh, a gift from uh, a man who would later have a new political appointment, the Duc de Nancre, who would then, uh, two years a or three years after, be named uh, the guard of the Swiss guards uh, of the Palais Royal, which was a very, very high position. So um, you can see uh, plus ça change, diplomo diplomacy and reciprocity, right, at, at, its, at its best for political uh, motivations. And in specific, so not only was this a gift, but this is a gift of an artist um, that is uh, a Bolognese artist, Ludovico Caracci, and uh, the Duke had a particular interest in the Bolognese school. So Bologna, located in northern Italy, and uh, the founder of the Bolognese school was Ludovico Caracci. Uh, the group of painters, uh, brothers, were working in Rome around 1600 on through the late teens and considered uh, a, a vital, vital force in the, the, the development of Baroque painting and, and supremely, uh, as, as an example in this picture, for the, uh, the intimacy of their approach to to religious subjects, uh, their emphasis also on uh, good drawing, uh, close cropping, and uh, dramatic yet very um, emotional uh, compositions and deeply uh, filled with religious uh, emotion. And, um, oh yeah, so this is what graces our catalog, and I don't know why I put this in here, but because I think what's so interesting is what made it to the, the catalog cover. I didn't, I wouldn't have predicted this had come, but the kind of, the, the grace and, and intimacy, sensitivity of, of this image clearly spoke to all the, our designer and all the other people who helped uh, make the decision um, for what would go on the cover. And I should, pardon me, describe the subject. This is St. Catherine, identified by the wheel of her torture. There's a spiked wheel and she's asleep. She's having a dream or a religious vision. And that vision is of course the, the virgin and child. And um, this is one of those wonderful examples. We know which gallery it was hung in. So in the exhibition, we give you the plan and you can see where you are as you're progressing through the palace. The glorious uh, or the crowning achievement of the Duke's collecting was his purchase of Queen Christina of Sweden's collection. It took seven years to negotiate the purchase. He was able to acquire over 100 pictures. We actually still don't have the right number because there are a few different ways of, of counting them, but over 100 paintings came to Paris. Who was Queen Christina? She is um, actually not displayed here. This is Countess Ebba Spar. But the reason this is here is because the Duke owned this painting as his beloved portrait of Queen Christina. So by the time he acquired it, it had actually lost its, um, its, its uh, proper um, uh, um, uh, sitter, uh, the information about the sitter. And um, Queen Christina was, uh, by all accounts, an extraordinary uh, woman of the 17th century, uh, ruler of, of Sweden, living in Stockholm, of course. And she, uh, she chose never to marry. Of course, part of, uh, for any ruler, uh, lineage was everything, and, uh, and she chose not to marry. She, in fact, abdicated her throne and uh, converted to um, Catholicism and moved to Rome in 1655. Before she moved to Rome in 1655, however, she had amassed an incredible collection. And she had instructed her, instructed her army, the Swedish army, during the Wars of Religion, when they were in Prague, to loot the Habsburg, uh, the Habsburg um, repositories. 
And they came back to Sweden with just a trove of extraordinary paintings that had been commissioned by, uh, may, you may know the name, Rudolf II, Titian, Veronese, they just, you know, she just, that's what she wanted. And um, so those, uh, so then she moves to Rome. I mentioned she abdicates, uh, she ab abdicates the throne, 1655, and in Rome, uh, <coughs> dies uh, 1689 and her heirs uh, are, who are in charge of her estate, uh, try to sell the collection. And uh, they are trying to sell it for some time until the Duke comes along. So she dies 1689, it's still unsold. In 1714, when our Duke, Philippe II, sends uh, his dear friend, Pierre Crozat, an emissary to go make the deal. And uh, Crozat goes once, he goes twice, the negotiations are not going well. They're not budging. They can't hammer out a price. Um, there's some wonderful uh, new documentation um, on the subject that was uh, just found in, in, in Paris archives. But finally, in 1721, the missive comes to the Duke that the deal has been struck. And over 100 paintings are, are slated to arrive in Paris, and they arrive in 15 crates. It's a massive, massive shipment. I just think about what art transport would have looked like in the 18th century. It's kind of baffling. And the, um, and the, the newspapers of Paris hail this. The, the, the Mercure de France uh, in 1721 announces uh, that, 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 that the greatest uh, art purchase in, in recent memory is coming to town and bringing jewels and morsels to town. So we have a small section of the exhibition, of course, devoted to this, 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 this epic acquisition. And um, this is... Oh, I'm s please excuse me, I don't know how that label is wrong, but this is Leda in the Swan, made by an artist, um, Andrea del Sarto. Perhaps today, not, not as much of a household name, but uh, in his day and until well into the 19th century, uh, was really valued as one of the greatest Renaissance artists uh, of the Florentine tradition. And this Leda in the Swan is, uh, was with Queen Christina's collection and had been uh, in Habsburg, in, in uh, the Habsburg uh, collections. What we're looking at is Leda. She is actually the wife of the king of Sparta. And we have a swan. As the story goes, Zeus, who's often getting naughty, we all know that, he is in love with Leda. So he conceives the plan to transform himself into a swan and seduce her. The uh, results of their union are Romulus and Remus, the early, um, of course, the founders of Rome, and Castor and Pollux. And actually, I'm not, I'm pointing to two pairs of, of children. They're not necessarily those pairs, pardon me. Um, Castor and Pollux, the early uh, great warriors of, of Rome. And so Andrea del Sarto, and I should say, the Duke had five versions of this subject. And that's something that we see repeatedly in his collection, is collecting versions of the same subject by different artists. And uh, how clearly that's about thinking about different ways of treating subject matter, uh, how artists over time are also in conversation with each other. I mentioned the Allori rela re relating to Michelangelo. And uh, that certainly was, must have been a part of his, of his gr great collection, assemblage of Lita and the Swan. Um, uh, uh, um, depictions. And so here is the swan, and I don't know, it's, is it lascivious or is it affectionate? It's kind of both, with the, with the wing coming out from behind and curving up. It's wonderful play of her arms and the swan's neck and the way that her figures, uh, fingers are, are, are affectionately kind of almost ruffling the feathers. And uh, the swan is actually, you can't see it here, but the swan is distinctly looking at us. The eye is looking at us. One thing I should say about this wonderful um, painting is that this is a poor quality reproduction because this is uh, the reproduction of the painting before it was cleaned. This painting in Brussels was in storage since 18, 
65 and has been uh, gloriously restored just for this exhibition. And I um, was gonna go in the galleries and take a, take a camera shot and it didn't come out well, so I'm giving you actually the older pre uh, cleaned version because I want you to go in the galleries and, and take a look at the 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 the, um, the way in which this painting has completely uh, been brought to life and so yet another example of how our initiative and the exhibition um, has had um, far-reaching um, uh, ways in which we've affected uh, bringing works of art together and things like this, new things that have been restored or brought to light also through some of our research in terms of connecting them with things with the All the All collection. This is a painting, as you can see, by um, Veronese, Venetian uh, Renaissance artist, high Renaissance artist, working in Venice from about the 15, late 1530s uh, till 15, uh, about 1588, 1590 at his death. And one of the, uh, I mentioned that as part of the Queen Christina purchase, the largest cast of pictures were Venetian Renaissance pictures and uh, uh, pictures by Veronese, uh, by Titian, uh, Tintoretto uh, in particular, the, the, the great trio. And while this painting actually was not part of the Queen Christina Purchase, it was displayed as part of the Queen Christina Purchase. What the Duke did was after he purchased the Queen Christina collection, he worked with his architect to design a room that would be a glorification of the art of Veronese. And that room is here. I hope by now you're used to our, our plan and I'm not confusing you. This room is shown here in elevation in a drawing. And she would have been actually, I think she was on this side beside a door. You actually, she was, ha she was probably just above eye height as you, as you walked through. And um, above each door, there were four doors to this grand salon, you see them here, one, some of them of course fake doors, but they were gloriously beautiful to give symmetry. They looked like doors, one, two, three, four. And above those were uh, the allegories of love, these uh, in gorgeous um, Ver Veronese pictures that are, that are in London. And this is called the Salon à l'Italienne. Uh, the reason why it's called the Salon à l'Italienne is because this was a type. This was a type of salon, meaning two-tiered with windows and mirrors. It must have been gloriously light and the mirrors were, were reflecting off of each other. And uh, everything in the room was, was the art of Veronese. I mean, it, it just must have been gobsmacking. And uh, also shows you this other way in which the intentionality with which the Duke displayed his collection and, uh, and really um, wanted to create this environment and was so kind of engaged with how his collection would, uh, would be displayed. Another aspect of uh, the hang or the specific areas or groupings of paintings at the Palais Royal is the Poussin cabinet, which I mentioned earlier. You'll remember the Poussin cabinet was, uh, is, on our, is on our plan as number two. And again, this glorious, um, this, this, uh, this celebration of, of, of French art. In addition to the work of Poussin, which I'll discuss later, as part of the Poussin cabinet, this work by Eustache Le Sur was a centerpiece. We know uh, where there was an artist who came to visit and we have his diary from 1717 that tells us this is actually held its own wall above a fireplace. Uh, the painting is quite large, it's a circle about this big. And uh, this is actually a, a, a picture that was thought lost. It was rediscovered in 1999 and this is the first time it's been lent uh, to come to New Orleans and to our show. Eustache Lusser was, uh, along with Nicolas Poussin, uh, one of the founders of the French Academy of Painting and Sculpture, founded 1648, and was sponsored by the state to foster uh, the education of French artists, send them to Rome to study, uh, provide a structure of uh, exhibitions and, um, and uh, discussions called conférences to discuss art, develop ideas about art, and was a, a very, very important uh, aspect of, um, of Louis XIV and his minister Colbert's um, uh, real dedication to the glorification of, of the French state and its expression uh, through art in all forms. Uh, this, what, we're, what is being displayed here, what, is being, uh, what we're looking at here is, this is Alexander the Great, Macedonian king, 
and he is on a bed. He's about to drink something, as you can see. Here is, this is actually his court doctor, and his doctor has given him the potion just minutes before Alexander received a note that said there was a conspiracy amidst. And of course, he understands when the potion is given to him that that conspiracy is, 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 uh, is about to uh, uh, affect him, or, or is you know, probably underfoot. And uh, so what does he do? He takes the coop and then gives the letter directly to the physician. So the physician is in a moment of realization. I hope you can see here his, uh, his surprise, his shock, his open mouth. You see here the other people also shocked all the expressions and here. And uh, so the focus on this particular moment, this moment of good judgment and a period of and time of antiquity, the style that is being used, the sculptural style, the, um, the very um, particular crisp uh, classicizing style, which, uh, which is very, very, very clear in its articulation, not only in the structure of the composition, in the um, the kind of hard marmorial uh, approach to skin, but also in the clarity of expression and color. This in every way was viewed, uh, really embodied the ideas of, of French uh, classicism. And I go through that because we're going to look at the other ways in which uh, artists in this period are, are, are thinking about art as a polarity to this classicism. Well, significance is an interesting question. It is a brazier. You can see um, you see the the white the, the the red flame. So that is a it is a brass what what is called a brazier. So there are coals inside uh, for heat. Um, I, it's interesting. I mean, I've I've certainly read extensively about this picture. Um, significance, I'm not so sure. I might reread, might go back to some articles, but I I don't. I, w I would say it helps bring you into, into the scene and helps kind of uh, uh, also relieve a bit of the continuity of the floor in some way, yeah. um, that it's more, more of an artistic device and compositional device. The next section of the exhibition is the Dutch and Flemish cabinets. Um, Philippe II, Duke of Orléans, was the uh, first great French collector of Dutch and Flemish art. Dutch and Flemish art, of course, being produced in, in uh, today, the Netherlands and Belgium. And uh, the, um, the height of, of activity in the Dutch Netherlands uh, and was in the 17th century, so the earlier century before. Uh, Dutch artists were appreciated uh, abroad already in their lifetime and in the 17th century. Uh, but in, Fran in Paris, they were collected, but not that much before the Duke. Louis XIV certainly had some, uh, some things in his collection, but, uh, but wasn't particularly engaged. And the Duke is the first major French collector of Dutch and Flemish art, and while he, there are some contemporaries also interested, he's really on the forefront. By the time you get to 1735, and certainly by 1750, the French are obsessed with Dutch genre pictures and, and uh, some of the great fine painters, which we'll review in a minute. And so um, the, Duchess, the, the Duke's wonderful collection of Dutch and Flemish art. Um, I show you our funny bird's eye view here. It's kind of, you can see how wonderfully jewel-like and small this, this picture on this wall is. And, um, and it's structured in the exhibition to be a smaller cabinet space um, because where these were displayed, if you look at our map, was right here. And these were uh, what were called the private apartments. Meanwhile, I mean, they were private but semi-private because you're in these public and ceremonial spaces to begin with, right? And um, these, so those were probably two or three rooms. These are the rooms we know least about. The inventory uh, lists a large number. I think it's, uh, it's somewhere around 150. So um, our, our plan here, I talked with the architect about it, that there probably were more rooms. But anyway, there were two famous rooms, the blue and the yellow room. And actually the center of his blue dining room uh, was this piece in the show. You'll go read the label. And so that's also why it's on the center of this wall. So these small areas were also where his most notorious uh, parties and, and fun gatherings uh, took place. And there was actually um, a door leading directly onto the street of Paris so could, you, could, you could get out without being um, found out by uh, the house staff. And you actually entered um, the, 
these private areas via a pocket door. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to go back here to show you that it's behind the Salon Italien. So you've got the Grand Salon, maybe you've got a view of the Gallery of Aeneas, but then you go through a hidden pocket door to get to the Dutch and Flemish cabinets, which must have been, uh, it's just a wonderful you know, conceit. You're really, as a visitor, you're being shepherded back to the private areas. It's very performative, right? And uh, the Duke's collection of Dutch and Flemish art really uh, encompassed, um, for the most part, a range of, uh, the range of, uh, that was representative of Dutch and Flemish art, uh, though with certain um, gaps and, and caveats, uh, and with a particular interest in the nude and Dutch and Flemish art, uh, as only now has, has there been a reappraisal of the importance of, of the nude, particularly to the, the later um, Dutch pictures. But I thought we might talk and unpack uh, one of the, five masterpieces in that room, which is Gerard Dow's violin player. This was uh, the painting on this back wall that is a wonderful little jewel. It is here uh, from Liechtenstein, uh, a very important uh, loan dated 1653. Gerard Dow was uh, an artist working in Leiden in the Netherlands. You may know Leiden as the university uh, city, one of Europe's earliest and oldest universities. It's about 30 miles south of Amsterdam. His teacher was Rembrandt, actually, and Rembrandt was himself fr from the city of Leiden. Dow uh, gained and, and, and enjoyed an, an incredible, incredible reputation during his lifetime, international reputation. He was, in fact, uh, he had a patron who, paid, hi who paid him a salary for the right of first refusal to his pictures. You can only imagine in uh, the 1650s and 60s how rare such an arrangement would be. And in fact, when Cosimo III de' Medici of Florence is traveling through the Netherlands, he visits, uh, he goes especially to Leiden to, to visit Dow studio. And this picture in every way uh, is uh, a testament to why he held such a reputation. We have an arched window and the panel itself is also arched like this. We have a man at this window playing a violin, leaning out. Uh, the carpet is here in wonderful textures. Look at these tassels, which is covering uh, a, a relief sculpture. And you'll see all these wonderful textures. Look at the, the, the folding of these, uh, these book leaves. Well, it's, uh, sorry, the pages of this uh, music uh, score. And uh, all of the uh, textures, the delicate sheen, and the extraordinary detail. It was, uh, in its period, uh, called invisible brushwork, though, it's course, of course, it's, it's not. Um, and he was uh, considered the founder of what was called the Leiden fine painters, as they said in Dutch, the fine schilders, and uh, generations, and, 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 and Leiden painters became uh, uh, very well known for this painstaking, incredible illusionism uh, of which his, his uh, pieces are, are particularly masterful. And of course, for in a picture like this, that illusionism is being emphasized by the arch window format, which, which pushes the, the composition out. And um, we, in fact, know that this is a self-portrait, Dow did a range of self-portraits. It was certainly a part of his um, a kind of self-conscious advertisement of, of his art. And uh, so we know that from other things. He's wearing a beret and he's playing music. So the painter as musician. So a painter, like a musician, uh, lulls us into a different world of harmonies and uh, and and grace, I, 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 it's, it's, you know, that, that quality in which music just kind of uh, brings you to another world. And so he is likening himself to a musician. What do we see in the background? Maybe you can see, see that's, a, that's an easel. And this is a painting on a strainer, so it's an unfinished painting. And do you see what's going on here? He's, this is, a, this is a, an apprentice grinding the pigments. So this is his studio behind. And then, what is here? I mentioned this sculpture that's being covered with the carpet. This is a, um, actually appears in many Leiden pictures of this moment. And this is a, a famous relief by a Dutch artist who had worked in Rome, a sculptor named Francois Duquesnois. And so it certainly was a known piece of sculpture, but why did Dow include it here? As a painter, 
he is mimicking sculpture, literally in some way covering it. And uh, so he's representing uh, sculpture, comparing it in some way to his art and to painting. What he's making reference to is an age-old debate from antiquity called the Paragone. Who are the greatest artists? Are they the sculptors because they make something in the round? And is that more real and uh, a manifestation of great art? Or are the painters the better artists because they create whole new worlds? I mean, of course, these are theoretical debates in which ways artists would, would talk. But so take the three elements together, um, Dao and his art is, uh, is, is, is and, and Dao and his art, it, and the three elements, right, studio, artist as uh, ma magician, musician, uh, and besting sculpture. So it's the glory of the art of painting is how all three elements come together. And um, this is how this would have been interpreted in the period. And interestingly enough, also just to mention it, um, a lot of these, uh, these jewel-like uh, pictures in the period, and see how small they were, they um, would have had, uh, a lot of them would have had a, um, a bronze bar and a curtain in front of them, so that when you lifted the curtain, it was this kind of performative act of seeing another world, and also emphasized that jewel-like special quality of these, uh, of these um, marvels of, uh, of technique. I would say the, the, the place we've gone out on a limb a little bit is this, um, this next exhibition section um, that uh, you can see is entitled Philippe II and Art History. So throughout what I've been uh, mentioning to you is, is, to, is the ways in which the Duke is clearly engaged with contemporary ideas of art theory. He's working with his, uh, um, his court artist, Antoine Capel. He's collecting in every and any manner. He's collecting different versions of subjects, um, a range of artists, first collector of Dutch and Flemish art. In every way, he's, um, he's very much, uh, I think, connected with the ideas and the writings of his court painter, Antoine Coipel, and his writings of 1721 um, in many ways can be considered a compendium to the collection. And so I think to think about the, the, the intentionality and a certain depth and this relationship with this court artist uh, gives uh, real meaning to thinking about the Duke's um, collection, his collecting, and, and, and um, his range of interests. And in, French, in fact, Antoine Coipel, in his writings, is the first French artist to write uh, in a very, very detailed way of the techniques of Dutch and Flemish art. He talks about Dow's works um, and also about the Bolognese school. I mentioned these Bologna artists. So this way in which the Duke is certainly, uh, uh, he's passionate about art, he's collecting in many ways, but he's, he must be connected and there are many ways we can view his collection as connected to these uh, contemporary discussions about art. And also when you look at the breadth of his collection, uh, one of uh, our arguments is that the collection he was forming was to be a representative of the history of art as it was understood in 1715, 1720. And that, that's, I think, uh, uh, really uh, important to think about, that, that, that ambition. But I, I do, um, I think that's an important way to think about uh, the collection. And that's part of what is so wonderful about the exhibition for our public. We have brought you six different schools of painting in European art. By visiting the galleries, you get to explore made, uh, basic and, and issues in Florentine Renaissance, Venetian High Renaissance, Dutch and Flemish, Bolo Bolognese, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that's you know, a boon uh, for us and our project. So as part of this, this room dedicated to Philippe II and art history, um, I think sometimes it works better with tours than others, but if you quietly read the labels, I think it does work. It is um, a little bit theoretical, and was, uh, with, uh, with theoretical issues in life always, uh, practice and theory often um, diverge. But uh, the, the cliff notes are that this is the work of Nicolas Poussin, the one we mentioned from the Poussin cabinet, and he was celebrated by the Poussinistes, so these were, uh, these were a faction of the French Academy that celebrated 
uh, the clarity of composition, of line, of bright colors, and also, um, as I mentioned with the Eustache Le Sur, the, the reference of classical and sober and moral subject matter. And so these were called the Poussinistes, where there's more emphasis to their mind on line and precision of drawing and a certain um, clarity of approach. And then you had the other faction. Remember Rubens' sketch? They were called the Rubenistes. And they, the Rubenistes loved the art of Veronese and Rubens and the Venetians and really extolled the values of action, color, expressive brushwork. And so that's what this juxtaposition to be. Of course, sometimes you go in the galleries and say, well, oh, but this, is, this has line, this isn't about color, but it's about showing you what these artists were talking about. And I think it's really um, interesting to think about how um, the Duke's collection really does um, reflect that. And so this art historical trio is kind of a little bit of a, a kind of poetic meditation uh, in some ways on what, um, what artists were, were talking about in the French Academy um, during, during um, Philippe's regency. And this, this painting is, uh, is a painting by the artist Dominichino. Uh, he was uh, another Bolognese artist. And this was in the writings of, um, it came up in, 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 the, in various editions of the writings of art theorists in Paris. So it's interesting that after those were written, the Duke purchased it and owned it. Um, but in particular, in 1708, uh, the writer Roger de Peels uh, writes an entire page dedicated to this painting um, and the clarity of its composition in line and, um, and in line with the Poussinistes. So again, I, I think maybe if you go back to the galleries, I, I hope you, you feel what I'm saying it kind of rings true, but I think um, it's, um, it, does, it, does, it does work, though uh, the Rubenist Poussinist debate can, can be a little bit uh, difficult if you haven't learned about it prior. I mentioned that the Duke's collection was, uh, became increasingly well known over the course of the 18th century in my introduction, and that already probably around the 1750s, uh, or at least, uh, yeah, probably 60s as well, we don't have, the, we don't have uh, solid information, uh, the family was uh, allowing visitors to come. So you'd be certainly in the know, but you could probably go during certain hours of the day. And I should say the genre of the guidebook, uh, the guidebook to, uh, guidebooks to Paris uh, st are initiated in the 1680s. And uh, so you have many, many editions, of course, and, and uh, also tourism as we know it is, is really um, develops over the course of the 18th century. And uh, that the Palais Royal, before the Regency, is mentioned in these guidebooks. It's mentioned as a place, um, as a, one of the nice buildings of Paris. After the Regency of 1715, one of the first editions starts to mention the paintings. So that gives us another example of how the Duke is, it's understood that his paintings collection is a part of his public persona. And so as you progress through the century, also some of these guidebooks have wonderful details of all the different paintings, of how they were hung at that moment, um, though, though they must have been moved for the course of the century. And what I'm showing you here is one of these um, luxury editions. Throughout the course of the 18th century, it becomes increasingly uh, uh, common to encounter, encounter and have published editions of great collections. This uh, particular one is called the Recueil Crozat. Recueil is French for compendium. And this one was published uh, in two volumes, 1729 and 1741. You'll notice here uh, our um, glorious Veronese. The earliest edition of 1729 uh, is advertised uh, actually in a newspaper in 1721 as something that the Duke is helping to organize with his friend Pierre Crozat. This is a new research in our project. And so we know that not only is there that catalog, the 1727 catalog I mentioned, but that the Duke in some way played a role in these, the beginnings of these early compendia that reproduced collections in Paris. And um, this, is, uh, these, um, this particular project uh, only reproduced paintings from the cabinet of the king, the roi, and Monsieur Duc d'Orléans, as well as a few others. So you'll see here, it's, our, it's, it's being equated with the royal collection. Um, and there's, uh, he's certainly always uh, competing with the royal collection. In fact, if you go back here, 
this, a, 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 um, this is a version of which a larger uh, copy, though this uh, it was in Louis XIV's collection, same with this painting. So there was also a conscious uh, competition going on there. And so, uh, and this becomes increasingly uh, popular over the course of the 18th century. You have dealers publishing them, you have uh, collectors involved, and there's a really a very, very lively, um, uh, not only, of course, art market for pictures and exchange of pictures amongst collectors, but of uh, studying different collections and, and having them. So the Duke is um, really on the, on, the, on the front end of, of this wonderful 18th century um, development. And of course, as we mentioned, that the, there is a way in which uh, the great uh, success and fame of the collection uh, was uh, the agent of its own demise, and um, that Louis uh, Philippe, um, Louis Philippe Joseph, or Louis the grand, the great grandson Philippe Egalité, chose to sell the collection. Uh, what I'm showing you here, I'll review in a minute. This is actually a digital component we've designed for the reading room that uh, that tries to ex to bring to life uh, the London sales. And uh, but let's review what the London sales were. So I mentioned that the collection was dispersed, that Philippe Egalité was, uh, was beleaguered by debt, and also he had a, a political ambition. He, he hoped to uh, prop up the, um, the revolutionaries, get rid of Louis XVI, and then he thought he'd be king. Meanwhile, but they were getting rid of the king. You, know, but you couldn't conceive that there was an actual revolution that was really going to happen. He himself uh, ends up at the, at, at the guillotine as well. But so, um, so all for naught, right, selling the collection. And, um, and uh, a journalist asked me, well, what, what would have happened if it hadn't been sold? Would it have been all in the Louvre? And I think the more interesting question is uh, that to think about how, um, as I will now show you, the history of English art in the 19th century would look entirely different. Um, the collection was sold in London, as I mentioned. Uh, to the, the, it took a while for Philippe Egalité to find buyers. He, just as we said with Queen Christina's heirs, he, of course, everybody overvalues their own things and, and, and want to strike the best deal possible. Um, there were, uh, he was approached um, over by various people who, you know, when he made it, it was somewhat made known that he wanted to sell the collection. And in the end, what happened was two, two enterprising dealers from London, Thomas Moore Slade and Michael Bryan, split up the collection into two parts, the Dutch and Flemish Northern pictures and the Italian and French pictures. Each dealer has backers that are investors. So they're investing into the, into the, into the sale price and they will get uh, shares from the proceeds. And all those investors, uh, particularly with Michael Bryan, uh, some of them were, were, we called them the noblemen syndicate, these, these English noblemen, they had the first pick um, of the paintings. And uh, and so this uh, very fascinating structure in the in the symposium we have that will be on in, in January there um, uh, one of the scholars who's written for the catalog will actually really flesh out the sales and um, and this uh, this way of working with having backers and a consortium to um, to manage to buy pictures is still very much how some dealers function today by the way it was really incredibly kind of modern but more modern than that. What did the dealers do? They took out advertisements in the newspaper to advertise that there were going to be some sales and that there were going to be viewings. And they, uh, both dealers, um, Michael Bryan had two galleries across London and uh, the other dealer had one. And they, uh, these were different time periods. One was in 1793, 1798, but we, we don't have to review those. Those details aren't for us right now. And they, so they advertised, and they charged a fee for entry. Michael Bryan's gallery was open for over six months. And on Tuesday afternoons was open for artists to come study. So you paid a fee, you paid a penning, and you had a brochure that you could go in with. Thus the first blockbuster exhibitions. And by all accounts, in, uh, in the morning papers, we have these wonderful, wonderful quotes from, from the London papers um, saying, you know, hordes are flocking to the Orléans galleries. One of them, and I put it on the wall, quotes um, 3,000 visitors a day. I, I, I suspect 3,000 visitors a day is, is, is a bit of an inflation. But that's not the point. The point is it was that impactful. 
that was the impression, that was the idea that it was that well visited and that exciting. And, um, and so what we have on view here and what we've replicated in these digital components, so that's, that's I mean, an interesting problem, right, for an exhibition and for, for a curator. I mean, how do, you, how do you bring to life these sales? I mean, you, you just, they, 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 you know, it's a story, it's part of our story, um, but how do you kind of try and evoke them or uh, in a way that is, um, you know, kind of impactful, but also, you know, the, the works of art are, or what is the priority? So what you know, it, it, we isolated in the reading room uh, some components that, that that try and bring this to life. And so um, you'll see here it says Farrington sketches of the Olean collection sales. So um, the artist uh, Joseph Farrington um, had his brochure um, of the Olean sales, and inside what he does is he notes the hanging, and all these numbers are the numbers in the catalog. Uh, these extraordinary um, uh, remnants are in, are in the holdings of the Getty, uh, the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles, and I uh, was able to, to study them, and they're, they're, they're quite well published. Um, so they also uh, show uh, the hanging, the different schools, and um, you'll see, look, that's the Veronese we just looked at, right? Also in print. And then, um, oh yeah, that's that Domenichino. Can you make it out, the one that was, um, oh again, part of our trio? So what we did was we, we isolated ones in the show, and then you touch on them and you can see the sale price and what they went for. And, um, and it's fascinating to look at the sale prices. Uh, as an art historian, you, you, you try not to do these things, but you, know, you, you can't help but nonetheless be curious in how uh, works of art have been valued over time. And that's another kind of sub-theme of our stories, the changing uh, values of, of um, of different artists in different schools. For example, uh, the Duke and um, his circle adored the Bolognese school. Uh, the Bolognese school, when it was sold in the London sales, uh, were considered some of the most expensive pictures. Uh, by the time you get to the late 19th century, it's a school in, 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 in art historical thought that is completely dismissed. Um, and then so there are a you know, range of other things like that. Again, um, a part of our whole story also of the life of pictures, where they travel far and wide, and how that um, has impact on, um, in some way, on our understanding of them. So the last room of the exhibition is to get dedicated to what I call the legacy. Um, I've outlined the sales, and uh, they're fascinating to study. And the sales are, in fact, the most studied aspect of the Olean collection, and was one of the reasons we decided to focus uh, particularly on, on the Duke. Um, the impact of those sales also on taste in England uh, was vast. Not only um, did English collectors uh, not uh, have as much art from the continent, they, um, they weren't as exposed to as many, um, as the, the range of art that was presented in the all in all sales. But what is the other more important feature of these sales? I mentioned 3,000 visitors a day, hardly, but something, charging of a fee, artists could come study for free. And what this did was, of course, bring a wider viewership to works of art that had been locked in a palace. And uh, one of the things I, I say here in my, this, this in the text is um, we have a wonderful uh, memoir of memoirs from an art dealer and artist named William Buchanan. He's writing in 1824, and he writes about his experience of going to the Orléans sales, and he just talks about how m it was just eye-opening, mind-blowing, it was incredible to see things that had been locked away in palaces, and for a wider public to be able to see this. Although, of course, a question of a public and you charged a fee, this is, this is a relative uh, thing. It's, it's not the, the, the grand general public. But a very important wider public nonetheless. And so what did that do, that wider viewership of seeing works of art? There is no question that that galvanized an interest in holding art in the public trust so that it could be accessible to, uh, to 
to a wider range of the population, but that also, on the flip side, you had in Paris so much cultural property leaving during the French Revolution that there they founded the Louvre as a way to also safeguard and celebrate art of the nation. And so you have that going on in London, in, in Paris, but then in London on the other end, um, there is no question that the sales played a kind of nascent role in, in ideas about um, access to art and public institutions. In fact, the National Gallery of London is then uh, formed and uh, founded in 1824. Inventory number one is the Duke's favorite picture, and it was founded with a core of six paintings by the Duke, the, uh, the, the six paintings of Orléans Provenance. And there were also other examples in Paris of um, some of these collectors who open, open their houses to, for artists to study. Um, and again, this was something that really uh, had its, its, its beginnings in, in, in the sales. These sales really, uh, I think, un unleashed very important um, changes in, in the British art world. And I should say that the William Buchanan, I mentioned, the memoirs published 1824, that um, he writes that the title of his chapter is called The Orléans Collection. And I use that as the title of our project because that's what it was about. It's about the reputation. And it's about um, something even beyond the Duke, the travel, the life of pictures, the legacy of the collection and its dispersal. Yes, this is not the greatest picture, but I put it in anyway. What you're looking at is the last sight line of the exhibition. Anyone who designs an exhibition and works with spaces, of course, thinks in terms of sight lines. What, it, what do you see? When do you encounter it? And this is your last sight line of the show. And what we have is our crescendo, is Rembrandt's The Mill. The Mill is here from the National Gallery of Washington in DC. And it was an absolute sensation when it was in English collections in the 19th century. Let's look at it more closely. We have a mill on a bulwark, a bulwark meaning old fortifications around the medieval city. The, kind, the moat around a woman who is here doing her laundry, the ripple effect, adding a slight sense of movement to the stillness of the water. There's a boat coming in from outside of the composition of, of mother and child walking. Elevated quite high up is this mill. Of course, a mill is, is a humble thing. It's just a windmill. But what has Rembrandt done? He's thoroughly monumentalized the humble. The mill stands tall, the sky, the, the, the sun is setting. The sun catches light on these blades, some in shadow, and some here also partially in shadow, which imparts a certain sense of movement, also adding to this drama of the, the setting sun. The, the sky and the clouds are in movement, all also here billowing up behind the mill, somehow opening up a uh, light of space for the mill. The, blue-green sky is, uh, is visible amongst these wonderful flowing clouds. It's in every way uh, epic and monumental. You have an extraordinary range of brushwork uh, typical of Rembrandt's uh, art and painting. Um, he can seemingly paint in a way that is not detailed. Um, but when you look up close and then it all uh, comes together, you can even see the rigging on the, um, for the, the, the sails on these blades um, actually articulated, but, but never in, a, in, a, in an obvious or, or a literal descriptive way, in, in a much more um, uh, um, a way that uses brush and, and paint. There's actually even a topography to the surface. And look at the worn path here with the wonderful changing of colors and the muddy browns. It is uh, uh, an extraordinary picture, and this painting was studied um, extensively in 19th century Britain. Oh, before I say that, I wanted to tell you that where it was in the Duke's collection. We don't know when, who he purchased it from, though the fact that the mill made its way from 
uh, from Amsterdam to Paris might suggest uh, having worked with uh, a dealer or agent, and we have various other examples of him collecting Dutch art through one dealer in specific, who um, I discuss in an essay in the catalog. But uh, regardless, so uh, I mean, and, and it's an extraordinary picture for the Duke to have owned. Rembrandt was uh, outside of, uh, outside of um, the Netherlands, known mainly also for his portraits, but also his, his etchings and drawings, and he did many landscape um, drawings. And uh, we do have about two dozen uh, landscapes um, by Rembrandt's hand, painted landscapes, uh, though this is uh, absolutely um, the largest and the most uh, ambitious in, in, in every uh, literal and figurative way. Um, so I mentioned the Dutch and Flemish pieces were tucked away in the private cabinets. Um, when you go through the 1724 inventory of those Dutch and Flemish private cabinets, the listing of the mill is in the kitchen. The private cabinets, of course, this was not a galley kitchen where servants did, because we, this is where he had some parties. So it's a kitchen wink wink. Maybe there's a, there's a, there's a sink, there's, you've got some wine or something. But I mean, the cheek, right? I have so much art coming out of my ears, I got a Rembrandt in the kitchen. Um, but, but also, nonetheless, the way that um, art theorists write about Rembrandt's art in, in Paris or circa 1700. There's a real emphasis on a certain glow of the pictures, the, um, the ways in which the varnish kind of scintillate and pick up the light. So I actually think that the, the, the placement of it in the kitchen in a dim setting was actually part of, of, of um, that aesthetic that they were talking about, that it would have been kind of appreciated in this kind of dimly lit candlelit room or with one small window. In the 19th century in England, this, uh, the mill was studied time and again. You may know uh, the names of uh, and the art of John Constable or Joseph Mallard William Turner, both artists who are central to the development of uh, the monumentalization of landscape studied the mill and wrote about their experience of the mill and its vital importance to their art in no small manner did this painting affect the history of British landscape and also uh, gestural and large landscape painting uh, from Turner and beyond. What we have here is a wonderful example. That's the mill being studied. And this is uh, at the British Academy. It's kind of a, a funny um, caricature. And actually among the artists here is a reference to the American artist Benjamin West, who spent some time living in London. And he also um, recorded that he's, what pleasure he took in studying the mill. So we see the ways in which the legacy of the Orléans collection has, in, in, in certain ways, a great impact for the beginnings of museums, or at least a wider viewership of art. Um, its role both at the Palais Royal uh, and in the 19th century in, um, as, as, as a, a place of study for artists is uh, in no small way significant. Um, and this painting, I also mentioned how far and wide they are. They are, we have paintings from, uh, you know, the from Norfolk, Virginia, and El Paso, and as well as Paris and London. And the mill, when it was sold in 1911, it was purchased by the American, uh, the American industrialist, Peter A.B. Widener, who lived in Philadelphia, and uh, one of the greatest, greatest collectors. Of course, in the American industrialists of the Gilded Age are scouring Europe, buying up European art, and there's always an outcry, you know, whether it's Henry Clay Frick or Paul Mellon or Samuel Cress. Why are you letting things leave Europe? And are these, these, these American industrialists, those, those nouveau riches are taking over. And... Um, and uh, just as part of that story, also, when the mill uh, was purchased by Peter A.B. Widener for the monstrous and unfathomable 100,000 pounds sterling in 1911, just think what, that, what that's like, I should translate it, uh, there was a huge outcry in the London papers, this can't leave, and who uh, made the biggest pleas were uh, groups of artists who signed letters. So Peter A.B. Widener brings it to America, it is, on, um, it is in his uh, home in, in Pennsylvania, and he donates his collection to the National Gallery of Washington 
as one of the founding bequests. The National Gallery of Washington, uh, our National Gallery, was um, the first stone was laid in May of 1939, and this bequest arrived in 1942. And uh, the mill is, uh, without a doubt, one of America's greatest, greatest treasures, and uh, its influence, its impact, its uh, sheer magisterial uh, beauty and demonstration of Rembrandt's art is uh, such a pleasure to behold and is reason why it really is the crescendo of our show and uh, is a rare loan uh, that we were able um, to get. And um, this is only one of 183 paintings from our original Duke uh, that are in uh, public institutions. I hope you'll um, go and behold it. Thank you. <laughs>